<laughs> I have truly great pleasure in welcoming all of you to the UCLA CTSI Distinguished Speaker Seminar. The I3T theme is celebrating our first CTSI uh, seminar for the season by inviting Dr. Owen Witte to be our distinguished speaker and anointing him as a recipient of the 2022 I3T Excellence in Research Award. I could fill half the seminar talking about Owen's lifetime achievements, but knowing how much this would irritate him, I will just give you a prequel for the upcoming attract attraction. Owen is a university professor in the departments of MIMG and molecular pharmacology, and his research has been recognized by dozens of groups at the highest levels, including membership of the National Academy of Sciences, the AACR Close Memorial Award in Cancer Research, the Association of American Medical Colleges Award for Distinguished Research in Biomedical Sciences, and the Stanford University School of Medicine's Arthur Kornberg and Paul Berg Lifetime Achievement Award in Biomedical Sciences, and many more. His scientific career has been truly remarkable in its breadth and impact. And during his over 40 years at UCLA, his leadership has had an equally profound impact on biomedical research and training on campus. We all know that Owen created the Broad Stem Cell Research Center in 2007, and for the next 13 years served as its director, organizing and growing the regenerative medicine research on campus. His research is a wonderful example of how immunology reaches into so many areas like cancer, cardiology, metabolism, and regenerative medicine. And he's never paid any attention to the artificial silos that we tend to erect around research themes and centers. Owen has made huge contributions to the understanding of human leukemias, immune disorders, developmental immunology, and epithelial cancer stem cells. For example, he discovered the tyrosine kinase activity of the ABL gene and demonstrated that BCR ABL oncoproteins drive human leukemias, findings that led to paradigm shifting therapies. He co-discovered the brutine, ty brutine tyrosine kinase BTK gene, which is required for normal B cell development. And he's made seminal discoveries defining stem cells for epithelial cancers of the prostate and other organs. But today he's going to present an entirely different direction that his lab has taken in recent years on identifying targets and new methods for immune mediated therapies. Owen is one of the few people who include a few football stars, Madonna and Ye, who go by a single first name. Owen, I hope that you're okay, that the, the award I'm presenting you today also includes the redundant but appropriate name, Witty. Thank you for accepting this award from the immunology community at UCLA and sharing your latest research with us today. Thank you, Gay. Here's your notes. Okay. Whoops. They took away my pointer. Before we get going. All right, here we go. I've got it. Thank you for those lovely remarks. It's really nice to have nice things sent, said about you by your colleague and friend. Um, but, you know, what else were you going to do? Okay. <laughs> um, this is so great to be giving a seminar to a three-dimensional audience. Um, the last couple of years, is, as we all know, has been a completely changed world. Um, I hope that this is a great first example of in-person seminars at UCLA and not a major infection event that will cause us to cancel everything. So, all right. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, work, uh, a little bit of old stuff um, to give a perspective on a whole bunch of new stuff. And I hope um, that everyone can appreciate that um, we need more targets for cancer therapy uh, in order to improve our outcomes for patients. Uh, and it's a big problem and a big question. 
And I think I've been working on it for about 50 years. So I'm not gonna cover every paper that we published in 50 years, but I'm gonna go back to some old work because it exemplifies how a, changing, a change in the technology environment of where you are and what's available when you're doing science changes and colors how you approach the problem and the kinds of answers you can get. Let's see, all right. Um, I graduated from college in 1971 from Cornell where I had a little bit of experience in virology and immunology. And if you had told me that I would one day give a seminar featuring a picture of Richard Nixon, okay, no way, no how, okay. I mean, he is the second worst president I've ever experienced. Uh, in, uh, in, in the 1970s, uh, the late 60s and early 70s, the Vietnam War was raging. Uh, people, my political persuasion did not like Nixon at all, but you have to give him credit for doing one thing that really affected the lives of many scientists, including me. He signed this National Cancer Act in 1971. And what that act did was really significantly drive the funding of the National Cancer Institute to a new level it had never seen before. And a good part of that funding went to the study of oncogenic viruses that are found in all species uh, that where they've been looked for, but particularly those in mice and rats and chickens, uh, which could be studied in laboratory environments. It made a big, big difference to the field and a lot of good things came from that research. Now, when I started at Stanford Medical School, I worked with a man named Irv Weissman, which just about everybody in this audience will recognize the name. Uh, Irv, then not so famous, an assistant professor struggling to get work done and get tenure like other assistant professors, uh, was working on a particular viral system. Uh, and he asked me to think about working on it with him. Um, the Maloney murine sarcoma leukemia complex of viruses. Now, this diagram summarizes about 30 years worth of work, mainly not mine, but others. And what it showed was something that really struck with me, stuck with me from, from then until now, which is that there are pathogenic mechanisms that can drive the growth of very aggressive tumors. Uh, in this case, inoculum of this virus within a week to two weeks, very large tumors occur in the flanks and muscles of these animals. But there are equally potent mechanisms of the immune system that when uh, the right antigens can be presented and the immune system can be activated in the right context, can regress or cure that mouse uh, from this tumor. Um, this led to what I've been working on for the last 50 years, which is if we could understand the pathogenic mechanisms in concert with understanding the immune response, we would have a much better way uh, to treat cancer. And that's pretty simplistic, but it's a simple big question that stayed with me uh, until today, as you'll see. We're still trying to figure out the pathogenesis and at the same time, mechanisms of immune attack. Now, back then, uh, we, now we know, I should say, that this immune attack is dependent on T, T lymphocytes. In 1971, barely knew there were T lymphocytes. We didn't know there uh, there were multiple subtypes and which kinds you had to have, how they were armed and activated and so on, uh, as we do today. Turns out that in this particular system, there's a single dominant epitope in the group antigen or GAG gene, okay, as it's called for this virus complex, which in the context of the right histocompatibility locus in the mouse H2, a subtype of H2, can be presented and effectively activate the immune system to get this regression. In a different strain of mouse that doesn't have that same histocompatibility locus allele, um, this antigen isn't presented and the animal succumbed to the tumor without an effective immune response. So none of that was known back then. And so couldn't study it because we didn't know about it. Um, but instead I studied um, how the virus proteins were organized in a structural sense and studied how these proteins were processed and produced and so on including the group antigen gene, the polymerase gene, uh, sorry, the protease gene and the polymerase gene and the envelope gene. Um, those studies were pretty pedestrian, pretty reasonable. They got published in journals like Virology and Journal of Virology. I didn't know that years later, they would 
be a precursor to studies of a virus called HIV, in which the same things we had done on this murine virus to define the importance of the protease gene would in fact be recognized as important in HIV and led to drug discovery uh, in the pharmaceutical industry uh, to produce inhibitors of the protease gene as one portion of the therapy for HIV. So the lesson from this to me is asking the right question, being involved in the right space, you're not really sure where your work is gonna end up and why it should be done. So after this experience as a essentially a graduate student working with Irv Weissman, I found my way into the lab at David Baltimore, another name everybody in this audience would recognize. And David's lab had, I don't know, 40 postdocs at the time. Um, and a lot of them were working uh, in different areas, but a few of them, Naomi Rosenberg, Steve Goff, and myself, ended up working on this system uh, called the Abelson virus system. Back then, people named viruses after themselves. John Maloney named the, the Maloney virus. Herb Abelson, a pediatric oncologist, named the Abelson virus after himself. It's a great experiment biologically. He injected Maloney virus into an animal that was steroid treated to ablate the thymus and basically look for host range mutants, in this case, different cell types that would be infected by this Maloney virus. And he came out with something he didn't know at the time was a combination of two viruses, the Maloney and the Abelson virus. The details of that are shown here. And eventually, this is right around the time where, where cloning came into existence and viral genomes were cloned and DNA sequencing was in its infancy. And this overall structure was found in which this gene ABL uh, was defined. Um, and I first found it as a, as a fusion with this gag Abel structure. Um, all of that was pretty routine in the field. There were lots of viruses being defined, lots of genes coming from the genome, a la Bishop and Varmus as oncogenes or proto-oncogenes that went into these viruses. But what was new, what was different was the definition and work that I did in collaboration with Ashim Dasgupta, postdoc in Baltimore's lab, who subsequently ended up as a postdoc, as a faculty member here at UCLA at about the same time that I came from but was the discovery that this ABL gene harbored this unique type of kinase activity called the tyrosine kinase activity. Um, I can tell you that it, although this has had a remarkable impact on drug discovery and cancer treatment and treatment for other disease areas, at the time it was viewed as a peculiarity of these animal viruses, okay? There were literally editorials saying, well, this can't be important. It's different, but it can't be important because it's only involved in animal viruses. And there'd be people at meetings saying it's just a strange oddity of, this, of these types of viruses. Um, but that changed um, when that type of kinase activity was directly connected to a human disease. And Jamie Kanopka, one of my first graduate students, uh, did this experiment which demonstrated a very large protein, P210, uh, approximate molecular weight, 210 kilodaltons, uh, in cell lines derived from a certain type of human leukemia. He wasn't looking for this. What he was looking for was a cell source that would have a lot of the cellular Abelson protein so we could isolate it and study it as an enzyme. This was a completely fortuitous discovery on his part, but he quickly figured out the details. And this work, as well as work from multiple labs like Ellie Kanani, uh, Nora um, Heisterkamp, and um, John Groffin, led to this overall picture of the connection of this specific kind of kinase to a human disease. And what's striking about it is that, in this case, it's not a virus which has caused a rearrangement of genetic material. It's a chromosome translocation discovered by Peter Knoll almost a decade earlier, leading to this two-part protein again. In this case, it's a gene called BCR, which is stuck next to the ABL kinase. Right? Again, highly activating the kinase and connected to the biology by structure. Um, I won't show you all the data, lots of papers. Basically, the, the key feature that we had to show was that this particular molecular entity uh, encoded by a nine kilopase cDNA could carry the biological information of, of this event. And we showed that, that we in this case being mainly Jamie McLaughlin, my wife sitting over there, who was able to clone this nine kilobase cDNA at a time when there were no kits, you couldn't order up clones anywhere, okay? You did it all from scratch. And it was really a beautiful piece of molecular biology uh, that she conducted. Uh, and then we had to get it sequenced. 
All right. Now, today, you know, people in my lab, they send out stuff to get sequenced all the time. And thousands and millions of base pairs are being sequenced every day here at UCLA. Um, it wasn't so easy then. The way we had to get this thing sequenced was we had to collaborate with my former lab uh, at uh, MIT at the time, David Baltimore's, with a technician, Mike Paskine, who was one of about five people in the world who could do Maxim Gilbert sequencing. I bet you half the audience doesn't even know what that is, okay? Uh, a chemical method for breaking DNA into fragments of defined length using radioactive tags and so on. So anyway, this nine kilobase cDNA, which had a particularly GC rich front end, making it very difficult to use dideoxy sequencing, was sequenced in collaboration with Dave Baltimore's lab and published. And then um, we were able, and again, the we is Jamie and other uh, folks in the lab, to build viruses that contain this cDNA and introduce it into naive cells and generate, again, a form, many forms of leukemia, showing that this was the motive force behind this kind of biological event. All right. Um, That'll come back in the seminar several times. The idea to define the pathogenesis by isolating the genetic element and transferring it into new cells to create a new biology. That's key to everything because then you're allowed to say, this was a part of the pathogenesis. It's not associated with it. It's not correlated with it. It creates the pathogenesis. Um, those types of studies led others, particularly Brian Drucker, Nick Leiden, uh, to lead uh, drug discovery efforts um, at com pharmaceutical companies like Novartis that led to the drug imatinib, uh, as shown here, Gleevec by another, uh, by its trade name, uh, and now five or six other drugs um, that are, I think, in combined sales, something in the $20 billion a year worldwide range. But literally curing patients with CML or at least prolonging their, their lives uh, by decades uh, in many, many cases. So this is a great example of sticking with the problem and understanding pathogenesis in order to lead to effective new therapy. Now, while this work was going on, we made the observation that these genes, the ABLE gene of, of the mouse virus and the ABLE gene of um, human CML, were particularly good at in vitro transformation of lymphoid cells, right? And it led to a hypothesis, uh, which turned out to be completely wrong, okay? But it led to a good experiment that there should be kinases of different cell types within the hematopoietic system that were responding to the activity of the BCR able gene product, and that they were the conduit for the information that changed how the cell grows. So we looked for kinases that would be lineage specific, okay? One of the kinases we found uh, is Rutan's tyrosine kinase. Again, fortuitous discovery by being in the right place, looking the right way and, and not letting it slide by you. Um, and the only kind of intelligent thing we did to focus on this kinase, one of many that were cloned out of these populations of cells, was to look away from the kinase domain to the other parts of the kinase, thinking that they may give us some specificity or idea of connectivity, and they did. And this kinase has an SH, what we now call SH2 domain or an SH3 domain, and those are protein-protein interaction domains that are very well known and very well studied. But it had a region upstream of that, which at the time was completely unknown to its function, but had some homology to a region within a gene called plextrin, okay, uh, which gave rise to a protein association domain called the plextrin homology domain. And the reason is because the plextrin gene actually has two of these regions within the same gene, okay? And that's all that was known about it. Turns out the plextrin homology domain, some of you may know now, uh, actually binds to certain classes of phosphatol and acetyl lipids, okay? Which are important signal transducing elements from both tethering proteins and membranes, uh, as well as activating signal pathways. We didn't know that at the time, but we did know that in addition to this gene being found associated with this human immune deficiency disease, this gene, when mutated, was also the cause of a mouse immune deficiency disorder called XID. And XID had been studied for decades before in terms of its phenotype and mouse genetics, uh, but we were able to show that the mutation in the XID allele that gave the mutant phenotype was a single point mutant within the XID plextrin homology, excuse, sorry, the BTK plextrin homology domain 
that was at a lysine, converted it to a neutral residue, and took away the ability to bind those phosphate and osteolipids. This is a beautiful example of coming back around to mechanism of mutation, phenotype, and understanding the macrogenetics of it at the same time. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool, okay, to find a gene for a human disease, explain it, and understand the mouse equivalent mutation. But the most important thing that we learn, okay, because this carries out and, and connects to every other signal transduction pathway that I am aware of, is that the genes that regulate how lymphoid cells respond, particularly in the case of the B cells, the B cell receptor, okay, uh, are often thought of as independent genetic elements but they actually almost always work in a large protein um, assembly called the signalosome. And this was one of the best examples, one of the first and one of the best examples of defining that signalosome, not just physically by isolating the protein aggregate, but by the fact that BTK, Blink, PLC gamma, and PLC beta, okay, are all genes which when mutated for loss of function, give the same macro phenotype in the mouse, okay? So this was a, co a combination of both physical data and genetic data over several years, showing this idea of a signalosome and concerted genetic action of all these proteins. That's probably the most important legacy of, of this uh, in terms of fundamental biology. But um, it's also true that this antigen activation pathway with signalosomes involving BTK made it clear that there were cell types in cancerous uh, situations like lymphomas, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, that could be attacked with inhibitors uh, that block the activity of BTK. And there's a whole new set of drugs, abrutinib is the lead uh, member of that, that are now uh, very successfully treating patients uh, with B-cell malignancies and now moving into autoimmune disorders that involve B-cells. Similar sets of kinases, signalosomes, and, and places to attack are found in T cells and just about every other cell type uh, when you look carefully for this aggregated signal transduction pathway. So what I've told you about is work that occurred in, the, in my group, at least our participation from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. So I'd now like to move into the 2000s and, and on. Um, but by telling you that what kept us interested in this was that fundamental problem about what was driving the mechanisms of pathogenesis. Um, and a lot of success was found in the field at large uh, for new inhibitors and new targets for things within the hematopoietic system. But there hasn't been as much success for treating um, epithelial cancers, the major epithelial cancer killers like breast, lung, prostate, et cetera. Um, so somewhere in about the mid 1990s, um, I got interested in studying prostate cancer. There's a whole slew of reasons for this, uh, but the most important of which was probably the fact that two people joined my group, um, one Charles Sawyers and the other Rob Ryder, he's over here. Um, Rob's a urologist, he's still here as a senior surgeon and head of our SPORE grant uh, in the Department of Urology. Charles was on the faculty for a while, but unfortunately got wooed away to Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, and both of them were starting their careers as senior postdocs into junior faculty members. And um, I was approached by Michael Milken, uh, some of you know, who's the head of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, a very wealthy individual here in Los Angeles, who was suffering from prostate cancer himself and wanted to set up a foundation uh, to study the disease. And he came and tried to basically entice me to work in the area of prostate cancer. Well, I didn't want to get started in a completely new field unless I had some company. And the company was Charles Sawyers and, and Rob Ryder, uh, both for their just general smarts and also because Rob, being a urologist, we'd have access to tissue. So set out in a new direction. Uh, and we did two things. One, as you can see in this first paper, is that we created models. There were relatively few models to study prostate cancer in the mid-1990s. And we began to look for targets for therapy, but also targets on the surface of cells that we could use to isolate and understand subpopulations of cells in the prostate. And one such antigen is prostate stem cell antigen. Um, <laughs> This combination of, of uh, some models to study the disease and one surface antigen was enough to form a company, okay? A company called the Gensis, uh, founded by Ari Beldegren, myself, 
Charles, Rob, and others, um, which went on to great fame and fortune here in Los Angeles. Um, and prostate stem cell antigen was an initial target for development. Um, however, um, by the time the company was sold uh, to a large Japanese pharmaceutical company, uh, they had lost interest in it. They didn't think of it, but it still lives on, okay? It's still a target for immune therapy uh, by multiple sites, including the City of Hope with Steve Foreman, who's running clinical trials using CARS to direct against PSDA. So that was our sort of foray into this. Um, but what we really wanted to do uh, was to create a way of making prostate cancer under our genetic direction, similar to the way we could create leukemia utilizing genes like BCR-ABLE or V-ABLE. And so we spent about a decade before this 2010 paper doing that with mouse tissues. Okay, whole slew of really good students and postdocs got their, you know, their, their careers set with um, looking at mouse tissue and using combinations of genes introduced by uh, viral vectors uh, to create models of prostate cancer. But we really wanted to work with human tissue so that all of the gene discovery and pathway discovery we did would be directly relevant to human cancer. Um, so um, Andrew Goldstein, the first author of this science paper, uh, really was the first to demonstrate you could take naive prostate tissue, in other words, normal prostate epithelium, taken at the time of surgery from someone with prostate cancer, but from a non-cancerous region, um, partially isolate the cells with the help of people like Dan Wei, you know, our great facts sorter, uh, and then introduce a set of genes, in this case in a polycystronic vector. Uh, the genes and the combinations really don't matter for this particular part of the story, other than to say it takes more than one gene, but it doesn't take 100, it takes a few, and uh, AKT or androgen receptor, to drive out in, in a transplant into a mouse, a model that's pretty faithfully representing the original initial stages of, of prostate cancer. So that opened up a technology to then look at more diverse genetic elements that might be involved here and to look at other more complex portions of, of prostate cancer. So to think about prostate cancer, you have to think about the natural history of the disease. Um, and this schematic, which will turn up a few times, is a pretty accurate representation of what happens. The vast, vast majority of prostate cancer is a absolutely stereotypic adenocarcinoma of the prostate uh, with clearly recognizable histological characteristics. 99% of men are diagnosed with prostate cancer and it's adenocarcinoma in the prostate. There are a few exceptions with names like uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer, uh, squamous prostate cancer, et cetera, but they're very rare. Okay. If treated locally with radiation or prostatectomy, many men are now quote unquote cured. The disease come, does not come back. However, unfortunately, when it does come back, uh, it needs to be treated with more systemic therapy because now it's usually spread outside the prostate gland to other sites, and particularly bony sites. Um, and there, all of the therapies, uh, and, and this is something that hasn't changed in about 70 years, are based on chemical or physical means of castration, the removal of androgen or androgen receptor signaling from the cells, which they depend on for their sustenance. That therapy is incredibly effective. 95 plus percent of men will respond uh, to this uh, chemical uh, ablation okay, of the androgen receptor pathway. Uh, the tumor decreases, the blood marker of PSA decreases, and the patient goes into remission. Um, unfortunately, over a variable period of time, and that's what the scale break shows, the disease can grow back. And here it's quite resistant to chemo uh, all types of chemotherapy that have been tried. And this is really where we need new types of therapy or to prevent this transition. And that's what I'll talk about for the remainder of the seminar. Um, another important event catalyzed by the Prostate Cancer Foundation and, and Michael Milken's charity uh, was the assembly of two very large teams to study advanced prostate cancer. One team was called the East Coast <laughs> Dream Team. Another team, uh, and that, that team was led by Arul Chanayan and Charles Sawyers. The second team was led by myself and, and Eric Small from San Francisco, and I'll get to our work in a minute. But one of the big outputs of the East Coast Dream Team was a massive analysis of biopsy material looking at, from late stage patients who had recurred after surgery and after initial treatment with antiandrogens 
for the types of genetic changes shown here on the left against the number of patients and to ask, simple question, what were the recurrent or most common mutations and what combinations did they occur in? Clearly, as you can see in the red bar at the top, the androgen receptor far and away in prostate cancer shows the greatest degree of genetic variation. Um, it's not uncommon to see this 50 or 60%. After that, P53, P10, various fusions with ETS genes, which are transcription factors, et cetera. But the big picture from this is not how things are similar, but how different they are, okay? If you go down any one of the columns, you can't find another column that precisely matches it, okay? So there's great diversification during this process, okay, of, of cancer recurrence, resistance to therapy, and regrowth, okay? So how do you treat that, okay? When it's highly variable, when no two patients are the same, what treatment can you come up with that's gonna be effective for a large fraction of the patients? Um, at the same time that that work was being gathered, the West Coast Dream Team, and here's the multiple universities that were participating. It was really quite an interesting way of doing science. It wasn't even the same as a program project grant where you integrate people who have already been working. To, this were people who had never really worked together, just coming together around this big problem. Um, and our West Coast Dream Team decided to do the following experiment. Uh, it was basically get these biopsies, evaluate them, look at gene expression and try to derive from the gene expression data, uh, you know, sophisticated RNA, DNA analysis, whatever we could dream up, um, some common pathway to allow us to try new agents in clinical trials, okay? Well, so my part of the job was to look at these biopsies with our pathologist, Jody Wang, George Thomas, and then try to you know, say what we could learn. Well, you don't have to be a pathologist to look at the adenocarcinoma, this thing in the middle, and the small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma here to realize that there were a variety of histological phenotypes. And in fact, the most important findings came from the first sets of biopsies in which there was a mixture of these histologies all in the same biopsy. Okay. What that tells me as a biologist is that we have a very dynamic system, that we're observing a snapshot in time of what should be a motion picture, and that to really understand this, we're going to have to understand something about the kinetics and rate of change of things, not just how A is different than B. Right? And that became our, our major goal. So going back to this um, diagram again, this initial picture of what prostate cancer is starting out in the you know, vast majority adeno now has to be modified as we come to this level here where patients are resistant to all of the anti-androgen therapies. And there's some number, and this will vary from group to group and who did the biopsies and which pathologist, but a very significant fact, uh, uh, fraction show these what we call small cell features, atypical neuroend. It's got about 20 different names, but what it really means is a really bad, aggressive kind of cancer. And the fact that 20 or 30% of the biopsies are called that, but we already know that they're often a mixture, simply tells me that it's probably 100% of the patients because we've only biopsied one metastatic site out of the dozens or hundreds that occur in each of these patients post castration resistance therapy. So what to do about this? Well, people started thinking about, um, well, how does this happen? Do you start from an adenocarcinoma cell and then differentiate under the pressure of oncogenic stimuli and then up with these small cell carcinoma cells here? Or maybe it's something different. Maybe there's a cancer-like stem cell that's lurking in the population that's labeled adenocarcinoma, but it changes into these cells as the adenocarcinoma cells are killed off and become resistant to the castration therapy. I'd say that all of these models are still possible, okay? But right now, most, most people are favoring that it's actually a differentiation or dedifferentiation, as you'll see, uh, from the adenocarcinoma into these intermediate and final states. Uh, but I think they... Jury is still out on some aspects of that. In a very busy field, this observation of this different kinds of histological prostate cancer has brought forth dozens of papers talking about genes like SOX2, EZH2, really interesting gene, FOXA1, 
transcription factors that will regulate large numbers of sets of genes and regulate other transcription factors to induce the kinds of developmental changes we're talking about. Each of these papers could be a whole seminar. Uh, this one is particularly interesting because not only uh, are loss of function mutations, uh, but specific point mutants able to carry out uh, transcriptional changes that are associated with these final uh, types of events. Um, what, what we decided to do, and the, the, the imperial we in this case is General Park, former postdoctoral fellow now on the faculty at Duke, along with a cast of thousands, including particular help from Tom Graber's lab um, on the informatics, was to develop a model system, it, again, in which we could convert um, normal epithelium of the prostate into these very, very aggressive types of cancers uh, with a defined set of genetic information. So it's the same experiment I was doing back in 1980, and it worked in the 90s, and it's still working now, okay, which is to create the biology under your control rather than observing it retrospectively from tumor-derived samples. Um, this is a little bit more complicated. You have to take the human prostatectomy tissue, isolate the normal elements, again, normal epithelial elements, particularly the basal cells, uh, which are hardier and survive all of the processing, and introduce a five-gene cocktail. It's MYC, a well-known oncogene that's important in all kinds of cancers. Uh, BCL2, gene we added to maintain cell viability because oncogenic stress can kill a cell uh, as well as cause it to grow. Um, an activated form of the uh, serine threonine kinase AKT. We do that by adding a meristillation signal, which tethers it in the membrane in a chronically active position. And two very important gene manipulations here. Um, there was a lot of data in the literature saying that these very, very aggressive small cell uh, cancers with neuroendocrine features almost always had lost either expression or function of RB and P53, all right? Not one or the other, but almost always both. So we created a knockdown of RB and used the dominant negative form of P53 to achieve that genetic outcome, or that phenotypic outcome. Uh, all of those genes need to be introduced into the cells uh, simultaneously, hitting the same cell to get the transformation outcome. Uh, we use the lentiviral transduction in this case, place them in an intermediate organoid culture, and then transfer them into an uh, immune defective mouse xenograft. And what Jun Wook got was really quite spectacular, to be honest with you. I, I really didn't think this was going to work, but it, it really worked beautifully. When you have all five genes together, you get these super aggressive tumors growing out, and they have both the small cell phenotype by histology, but they also have these neuroendocrine markers, NCAM, chromogran, and synaptophysin. They're like the jackpot experiment. It's incredibly reproducible. He can do this over and over again with these viruses, and now other people in the lab have shown it as well. But if you leave out a gene, which is something we can do because we created the genetic mischief, okay, and you leave out BCL2, you don't really change any of that except the efficiency of the event is a little bit lessened because too many cells are dying of initial oncogenic stress. But if you leave out different genes, like here leaving out RB, or here leaving out the P53 dominant negative, or here leaving out the... Oh, you know, there's a mistake in this slide. I've shown this slide about 500 times. I never noticed that this minus and this minus were the same. That can't be right, okay? Nobody caught that. Nobody, should, nobody told me this after, how many years have I been showing this? Since 2018, obviously. Um, if you leave out a gene, okay, of the remaining genes, like one, minus RB, minus P53, you don't progress to the small cell phenotype. You stay as the adenocarcinoma histology, and you have very limited expression of these neuroendocrine markers. So this said to me that it was a really important step forward to knock out P53 and RB uh, to get these developmental changes in the nature of the tumor. And that's shown just beautifully here uh, by the technique of ATAC-seq. I won't go over it in great detail, but the larger the bar means a greater number of changes between any pairwise combination. And basically when you leave out P53 and RB together, you have a dramatic change in the number of accessible or not accessible sites in the genome of these cells, okay? Saying that they are major regulators of chromatin instability or change in this system, all right? So we knew that, uh, what else should we do? Well, I told you already that kinetics is gonna be really important here. So since we control the transformation, um, 
Others in the group, particularly Alka Chen here in the audience, along with the rest of my group, which seems to only sit together and they all ate their lunch at the same time, I noticed. Um, did this really big, difficult experiment, um, um, which is to make these transformed events uh, through the organoid stage, set up lots of these xenographs, and then sample them kinetically across a 10 or 12 week period, okay? A lot of work, a lot of tissue taken, a lot of data generated, and apply techniques like RNA-seq, ATAC-seq, and eventually single cell RNA-seq and help get a lot of help from Tom Graber's group in the analysis of this data. And it comes to a really interesting and important finding. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that in addition to Jin Wook showing those changes in a prostate, he could show that the cells that we evolved in those transformed models were also nearly identical uh, by, or, or very, very close to RNA expression from cells of small cell lung cancer. So a completely different tissue type but with a very aggressive similar histology tumor were also closely related to the outcome from prostate. And he could take normal lung epithelial cells with the same set of genes and drive them to the same small cell phenotype. So what Olga showed with her data in collaboration with the Graber lab um, is that you start over here, okay, um, with the normal prostate, okay, in the light blue, and then migrate in this direction by this uh, PCA analysis. Um, and if you look at the green, which is lung, lung tissue and lung cancer into more aggressive lung cancer, they come to the same general area. So this is sort of the evolution of a set of RNA gene expression data showing this convergence uh, phenomena really quite nicely. And in this case, in all this experiment, over this time frame. Okay. Well, there's a lot to do here. And I can just show you a couple of pieces of data, but there's almost an endless amount of data to be analyzed. If you look again over this time course from the basal cells to the organoid stage, the early, the transition to the endpoint, you get an array of different transcription factors displayed here in, in a graph name I can't remember, but the length of the line is an indicator of the dosage of the gene measured at the RNA-seq level. And of course, the, the names are what they are and the boxes are there to exemplify that some of these are well-known names in this field of cancer biology, like ASCL1, uh, one cut SOX2, which I already mentioned, Neuro D1, POOF3, and OLEG2, and so on, uh, to say that the representation of transcription factors along this time course is emulating what's seen in the naturally occurring cancers. Okay. You can also look at it by single cell analysis. And the most important thing to me is that each one of these slides probably costs $50,000. Okay. Um, and so, uh, I, I just hope people will stop saying we have to do single cell sequencing because it was friggin' expensive. Um, but nonetheless, it was done. Tom said we had to do it, so we did it, okay? And it was great. I mean, it shows you things you couldn't see with the other data. And the most important point is that as you go from early to late, again, in the time course, you go from epithelial cells to intermediates which look very similar to IPS cells and ES cells, and then eventually accumulate cells that have strong phenotypic expression of RNAs resembling things that have entered into the neural lineage. So again, all of this uh, makes a good deal of sense. And then what was interesting is, is the observation that some of these key transcription factors that other people have assigned important biology to um, may not be quite as important as they might have thought. For example, here's this neuro D1 factor. It's only a small population of cells in the late phase that has that factor. ASC1, uh, similarly, one cut some. So the impression I get from this data isn't that there are defined outcomes that have to have that transcription factor to be this cancer, but rather they're in one of several assortment of things that could happen at the end of this process. Um, they don't strike me as really good things to treat these cancers with unless an individual's cancer is dominated by it, okay? And I don't think that's the case that we're gonna see. In fact, small cell lung cancer and the small cell prostate are beginning to be subdivided into types that are exemplified by these transcription factors, but I doubt that they're the driving factor that got them there. And so we have to look for the other genetic elements that are at work here. And then finally, um, in, in recent analysis uh, that Alg has done, um, this pathway to the end stage here uh, that would be, can be shown to be actually bifurcated, that there's probably two major highways for these developmental changes that are being driven by these 
changes way up here uh, and then whatever improvement and changes occur during the transition. And we'd like to understand what's driving that process uh, in addition to defining that it, that it occurs. And that's kind of the next phase of these studies. All right. All right. If you have a process that's changing and giving you alternative outcomes or alternative pathways, what can you look for, okay, to treat uh, these cancers with, okay? If you knew what genes were regulating the progression, and we don't at this point, you could treat that. But if simultaneously, uh, or alternatively, I should say, if you could find something which is expressed along that developmental pathway, even if it wasn't driving the genetic change, the changes we're, we're seeing and the epigenetic changes, we might be able to treat that as a surface antigen or a presented peptide uh, for the T cell uh, system. And so that idea shown here, which is you know, about as popular a scientific idea as you can imagine, we're gonna treat everything with immunotherapy these days, depends on knowing enough about the cells you're trying to treat in terms of their pathogenesis, but also in terms of their gene expression to get new targets. And so back to that diagram again, if you were gonna use immunotherapy, when should you use it? Um, and my graduate student Mao has made this slide and it says immunotherapy with a big question mark. Do you wanna treat late? Of course, the patients desperately need some sort of treatment here. Well, by then the patient is filled with tumor. It's undergone who knows how many changes and you're not even sure which type of tumor you're treating at that point. Why not treat earlier when it's still an adenocarcinoma with defined gene expression? And so, so I'd like to consider both of these as reasonable alternatives. We have projects in the lab looking at both. Um, so how to get targets for prostate cancer? One would be these things we call public antigens. It might be a prostate tissue antigen. I'll show you one project with that. Another might be private antigens or neoepitopes as they're called. Probably not gonna work well in prostate cancer. It's a relatively low mutation rate cancer. The other might be I guess you could, I don't know what I just did there, get rid of it, uh, semi-private antigens. They might be cancer-specific antigens derived from a process like splicing, which can alternatively generate forms of proteins that might have unique antigenic determinants. And I'll give you an update on these. And I say update because these projects are far, far from done. And in fact, one of the things I'm hoping by giving this seminar, somebody would be interested in saying, I'd like to work on that. That has great potential. I've got space in the room for postdocs, technical staff, assistant professor type positions, maybe graduate students if they're in collaboration with another professor, it's the way I'm doing it these days. I just, at age 73, taking a graduate student who takes six years, I, I think I should have some partnership in their guidance. That's probably a good thing. If feeling healthy, this is not a retirement seminar. <laughs> um, so prostate tissue antigens. Um, Here's the neoepitopes um, for prostate, not high enough to really think about using that, but there's a lot of tissue antigens. And the one we're working on is, is prostatic acid phosphatase for a number of reasons. The most important of which is that it really is very, very tissue specific. If you look elsewhere, you can hardly find any expression at all of prostatic acid phosphatase, but it's highly expressed in prostate carcinoma and of course the normal tissue, but following a prostatectomy, uh, that won't be a target tissue for any problems. Okay. Um, Mao, great graduate student in the lab, he will eventually graduate soon, we hope, um, did this wonderful set of experiments to use physical techniques in combination with algorithmic prediction to define the potential immunogenic epitopes of PAP for the HLA A2.01, the most common HLA subtype. That's published, I'm not gonna go into the details, but the take home message is it's good to use multiple techniques because they don't all give the same answer, but the aggregate sum of the combination of techniques gives you a more complete set of peptides to work with. Um, we also had to now face the difficult task that finding a TCR for a specific peptide antigen is a tough job. There are billions and billions of different TCRs trying to match the, uh, in its repertoire of T cells, trying to match the universe of antigens that might be presented from infectious agents that, that we've evolved. Um, to find that, uh, we've used co uh, more common techniques like activation markers like CD137, and also a technique we developed in our lab called ClintSeq. This is just a summary of God knows how many people's work over how many years, I don't even want to think about it, but more than a few um, people and more than a few years to go from donor blood 
to sequencing to candidate TCRs that we could evaluate for potential uh, use in, in reacting with PAT. Um, one of these TCRs, I can't remember which one, is 156, somewhere in here, there it is, okay. In addition to showing release of interferon upon stimulation uh, with antigen peptide presentation, also showed a really modest amount of cytotoxic behavior in, in those direct assays. Uh, so we know we needed to improve that. And Mao went ahead and did a, uh, we call poor man's mutagenesis by just changing residues in the third complementarity determining region of the chains of the TCR um, in a very small scale mutagenesis with al uh, alanine scanning or changing, uh, converting polar nonpolar residues and actually came up with some mutants that improved or a mutant that improved the activity of the cytotoxic event here shown in purple compared to the initial TCR we isolated in green. Still not good enough to really think about this. Could you treat a patient with this TCR? So to go further with this, we teamed up with the lab of Chris Garcia at Stanford, who's really just a whiz at sort of biophysical and molecular technologies to improve how antigen receptors, both antibodies and TCRs work. And he previously published a really nice paper on something called catch bonds. Um, now I couldn't do justice to the biophysics involved here, but the idea is that upon initial interaction of the T cell receptor with a peptide presented in the MHC cleft, um, it's not really just like a lock and key mechanism. That's the initial way that it starts, but it can be the induction of allosteric effects that actually change the shape of the complex in such a way that the reverse reaction, the separation of the TCR from the peptide and, uh, presented in the MHC is now uh, much uh, resistant. And so you enhance the overall affinity by decreasing the back reaction of the complex. And that's what a catch bond is. And so we've been collaborating with the Garcia lab to look for catch bonds that would improve this uh, TCR and in fact have found them. And, and I think the first set of experiments gave several candidates that look really good. Here's the original TCR, and this is again, interferon release. Um, Here's the mutant that Mao made. It's a bit better, but we know not good enough. And then here's a couple of these catch bonds that we're continuing to evaluate for cytotoxic behavior and so on. So that's the plan, is to take the remaining TCRs that we have, as well as this one here, and try to uh, amplify uh, their activity until we get something that has sufficient cytotoxic activity that it's worth going through uh, sort of preclinical validation for considering using it in patients. Okay. Well, we need a lot more targets for TCRs. And in the last few minutes, sorry, going over, you know, out of practice. Um, we need a lot more targets for TCRs. The field is dominated by a few targets and many, many groups working on them. I, to get there, we're working in a collaborative group, which includes Gay and Chris and Yi Zing, a former professor here at UCLA who uh, left to go to Philadelphia uh, in a collaborative grant, again, a very different style of grant than I, I'd ever had before, uh, called the IOT and Immune Oncology Translational Network uh, to utilize uh, or ask the question whether we could define by alternative splicing new TCRs that may be suitable for cancer therapy. Um, I'll just say it really simply. RNA does a lot of things that makes great variation. So if you want to look for a change in a biological system, uh, the gymnastics that RNA can produce are quite amazing. Alternative splicing is one of the major events. And so we've been looking at that. Um, here's our plan. Look for new epitopes that Yi Zing, who's an expert computational biologist, did that work. Um, use different T cell sources. The Seats and Crooks lab have developed this wonderful ATO technology. I won't say anything about because they should give the seminars on that. Uh, or use healthy donor PBMCs. And most of the data I'll show you to date has come from that. Uh, you can find TCRs using mechanisms like surface activation markers or this Clint seq technique and other things that we're working on, and then hopefully we can validate them. So can we get around this immunological circle? Um, I can't possibly explain this to you. This is these things work, but he is a, truly a world's expert in developing these algorithms to define splicing and to look for specific characteristics that we could use uh, to define sets of peptides, and that's what this sort of chain of events is all about. Um, it works. He does give us lists of peptides here from castration-resistant prostate cancer, here from neuroendocrine. And the things we look for are specificity markers. You want it to be very cancer-specific, but you also want it to be reasonably highly expressed because we know you have to have a, enough of that peptide presented for the T-cell to functionally interact. 
that we've gone through that. You also have to cross compare it against the RNA database of normal tissues, which is done. And then this is what happens. Start with a couple of hundred peptides, and this is a, a huge group effort in my group. All the important people are listed down below. Uh, I think we might have a couple of people missing who are working on it, but not listed, sorry. Um, whole bunch of tested, end up with a sub number of TCRs that we think can target about eight of these peptides. Here's one of them just to show that it works, this epithelial antigen. TCR number 238 looks about the best um, at this point in time. And we go on to validate it with techniques like activation of interferon release, or in this case, cytotoxicity. And this one really works nicely. Okay, this is the kind of result we're looking for. It really drives cells uh, to a cytotoxic death. Uh, in vitro. And now we're going to go on and test, obviously, in tumor models and so on. Um, but if the specificity of expression of this um, can be validated, uh, we can get all the way around this functional validation and hopefully have candidates to be used as therapy in these very, very aggressive kinds of cancers that I, I talked about earlier. Um, I said it was in progress, and I really mean it. This, this project has taken a long time to get to this point where we have, I think, realistic candidates. There's a lot more work to do and a lot more work to credential something to go into therapy. And on my first slide, I had that laundry list of companies that I work with. Uh, all of this work is done academically, supported academically, uh, but I hope that it would one day be good enough to get into one of those companies or another company for actual clinical development. Because the one thing we can do at, at, at academics is that we could test the idea, but you can't really make a product uh, at, at UCLA. You can test the concept, show that it could be a product, and then you have to hand it off to somebody who can do the final steps. Anyway, I tried to mention the key people for the subprojects, and others are listed here, including some people who are uh, no longer in the lab, and particularly want to note John Phillips, who many of you know, uh, was an adjunct assistant professor in the lab and passed away from a glioblastoma uh, within the last couple of years. And uh, just, we miss him. And uh, the TCRs are actually all named JP something uh, in our notebooks, in, in both because he started the project and, and frankly, in his honor. So I'll stop there and be happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. And if any of you in the audience want to ask a question, you will get thrown this blue cube, which I've never seen before, but apparently there's a microphone in there. And so that it doesn't break, it's protected by the blue cube. Okay. No questions? Three and a half years of pandemic and nobody has a question? Huh, just talk, talk to the cube. Yeah, so I, I, I want to ask you a tough question, I think. Uh, along the way, or at least at least from my learning, you know, there was that period of time where we learned mm -hmm. in prostate cancer it's the androgen receptor. There was, you know, we we were looking for alternatives, and the androgen receptor kept showing up. And then drugs got developed, and they made a big difference. And then we learned that these cells can change into cells that don't need to androgen receptor. That's right. Another kind of surprise. I don't think too many people predicted that. Now, the, the tough question is, I know it's been hard to model androgen receptor positive prostate cancer. Can you give us any insight into that? It's really a peculiar situation, but if you try to grow a primary prostate cancer from prostates that have taken a prostatectomy, no one has successfully grown those for any length of time into any useful models. Uh, whatever it is that they need for sustenance, it, nobody's figured it out yet. And I'm talking lots of good people trying for a long time. So whatever that growth state is, it has some kind of communal or in situ event that we can't recapitulate um, out in the test tube. Um, that's, that's number one. Number two is that this idea that prostate cancer changes over time and what's killing men is the outgrowth of these non-androgen receptor dependent tumors. That's now very commonly accepted. And I think the question is, when do you start treating that? Okay. If you know that's the outcome of even excellent therapy with a drug like enzalunamide developed here by Charles Sawyers and Mike Jung, um, should you wait until it happens or should you treat that early on? good sense and logic says you should treat it early. But if you start thinking, how do you do that clinical trial? What's the cost of it? What's the time till outcome that you can measure? It's, it's enormously expensive. And so not surprising the pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in it at all. 
Okay, so it'll have to be done in some manner in an academic setting to show it works. And then all the pharmaceutical companies will be interested in it because once they know it works, it's easy for them to spend whatever it takes to get the next drug in the area. So I think that's the conundrum, okay? We know we have to treat in a different way. We just don't know exactly what and exactly when. And so, okay. All right. Thank you, so Thank you all.